WRFN 107.1 Radio Free Nashville. Hello, Ruthie. We know you're out there listening to us. Uh, you folks, Ruthie's got a lot to say about songwriting, so give a listen to this interview. It'll really touch your heart. Uh, folks, you're listening to Give Me a Break Radio Hour. My name is Bobby Pizzazz. Uh, popcorn, um, if people wanted to get a hold of you and like send you an email, say they wanted sure. to, say a gifter out there wanted to help you out with the Songwriters Festival, right, right. how would he get a hold of you to give you a big chunk of change or something? Us, contact us at uh, <laughs> popcorn at songwritersfestival.org. Okay. Or they can give us a call at 615 424 one four nine one, folks. This is a great event, and I mean, it helps out a lot of folks. And I was just amazed at the amount of talented people that show up for this thing. And uh, we're going to do a special thing here. This, we're gonna, yeah, I'm going to do, do this. I surprised you a little. Anybody that comes to the event June third, fourth, and fifth, and mentions Radio Free Nashville, give me a break. We will give them a three day general admission armband there you go folks all you got to do is say give me a break radio free nashville come to the information booth. In- information booth and you're in for three-day pass now right. you can't you can't do better than that <laughs> so folks we will hope a lot of you guys come out popcorn i'm telling you you've got a great heart you've uh, you've been working on this salad now this is the ninth one uh if you go to the website and pull up the play schedule at songwritersfestival.org you can actually click on each person's name and and check them out uh the thing about our festival is that anybody can come and play it's not an elitist fest it's all in one place and we have the novices and the professionals all thrown in together because we need each other the pros need the novices uh to give instruction and help to guide them and then the novices need the professionals so it's a great, it's our ninth festival also. 17 instructors over the three days, June 3rd, 4th, and 5th, and classes are going on at the same time during the festival. Friday night, we have our Grand Master, kind of like a Mardi Gras party, you have a, a Grand Master. So we have, the Grand Master comes and accepts the uh, award, and he blesses the songwriters in songwriter land, and we give him the keys to music row (laughs) and his name is joey wells oh wow joey was with the bill haley and the comets he's an original founding member of the rock and roll hall of fame hello my name's don miller and give me a break the old veteran shook his head disbelief Set up all to keep this country free. Now I'm homeless, live out on the street. Nobody who cares about me. He said, under these ragged old clothes. It's a battle-scarred body and soul It's not even this blind man could see That this country ain't what it used to be He said, where did America go? I haven't seen her since before
me where did America go? And my guest is Willie X. Evans. So, Willie, tell him the name of the show and what's all going on. The name of the show, uh, Bobby, is Rock and Roll My Soul. And you can get to the website at www.rock, A-N-D, rockandrollmysoul.com. All of a sudden, it just became clear I was supposed to do Rock and Roll My Soul. And uh, a friend of mine, Don Bowles, in Memphis called me. And he had been talking to me about doing a nonprofit for years. And I had no idea what to do, you know. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, I thought it was a great idea, but I didn't know how to do one. I'd never, I've never done one. Isn't that neat that you don't have to know how? You You don't. You you just just do it. it. You just do it. it. You just do it. That's it. Uh And so... He told me a story of a friend of his, Mike Gardner, who played with the Gentries and played on Jimmy Buffett's Changes in Latitude, Changes in Attitude, and several other Buffett records. He was, Don was his neighbor, and he uh, had gold records all over the wall. The guy got an abscessed tooth. I know that one. He didn't couldn't afford to go to the dentist at this time because for whatever reason he was down on his luck and like all musicians too proud to ask for you know the help that he needed and uh he didn't get the tooth pulled four days later he died from an abscessed tooth hi this is bobby pizzazz wrfn 107.1 Radio Free Nashville. Tonight, we're honored to have with us on the telephone, Ruthie Steele from Gainesville, Georgia. Hello, is this Bobby? It sure is, Ruthie. Hey. Uh, With us tonight on the phone, everybody out there in Radio Land, we have Ruthie Steele, who is just... She's an amazing lady, and she's got a whole lot of stuff for us tonight. And Ruthie, how are you this fine evening? Well, I'm doing good. Uh, It's really, really nice to talk to you. It's been nice getting acquainted with you. Well, Ruthie, uh, I've been watching you on Facebook, and I know that I know that your family has uh, really had a big influence on on the Nashville scene and and on music itself. So, um, but 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 I'd like to start out with uh, asking you first of all, where are you from originally, and and how did you get into music? Well, actually, I was born in a tiny little town called Hard Scratch, Iowa. They think I'm kidding, but I'm not. Hard Scratch. Hard, and it was. Too. As a matter of fact, when our family left, uh, there was population 13, and we were 12 of them. Wow. <laughs> yeah, really. It's a, it's a little town in Iowa, and um, then when I was about 15, my older brother, Link Barnes, had uh, been in the Army, and he started uh, playing guitar and formed a little band in the Army. And he wrote to me and told me that if I'd learn how to play guitar, I could be his girl singer for, in his country band when he came back. So you better believe I babysat and scraped up enough money to buy a guitar. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you did. And uh, when he came home, he put me to work, and uh, I started professionally at age 15. I'll be darned. And, wow. Uh, there, I've done it my whole life. Yeah, you have had an amazing career. Um you were talking to me earlier about a couple of songs that you wanted to talk about, and the radio is all about songs, but what I'd really like from you, if our, our listeners are kind of wondering what it was like when you were coming up in the music business, and, and, and tell us some of your experiences, and, and I know that you know a couple of friends of mine, and so I'll just mention them, and we'll kick that off and let you start, but um, when, you, uh, when you had your band and you first came to Nashville, uh, I understand that you ran into John Denny. Well, actually, that was pre-planned. Uh, I had an agent. This was uh, after I'd been in the music business for quite a few years. I was in my early 30s. Oh, really? And, yes. Uh-huh. So we have to start back further than that, don't we? Yeah, you have to start back much further than that. He was the one that gave me my uh, start in Nashville. 
but I had a uh, very good career in Omaha and the surrounding area there uh, from the time I was 15 until I was about 32. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. Uh, I learned to play guitar and went to work in uh, Link's band. It was it was called Link and the Chain Gang, Link <laughs> Barnes and the Chain Gang. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and um, then... Uh, uh, after after Link got married, he kind of hung up his guitar. He bought a, a bar and named it the Guitar Bar. Oh, be darned! Which is great, but uh, he he quit the he quit planning to be a star. You know, while I was working with him when I was fifteen, sixteen years old, we went down to uh, Del Rio, Texas, and San Antonio because that was the big Texas was much more well known for the country music then than where we were. Yeah, and uh, so we had all those plans. But anyway, he got married, and that was the end of that for him. But uh, he hung in there by having the guitar bar and having little sing-alongs and stuff in there. Now, of course, he had two sons, uh, three sons actually. That went. He had four sons, but three of them went into music. Huh. And uh, two of them are still very active in it today. And uh, the younger one uh, uh, died tragically many years ago. But he was a fantastic talent. Would have been a big star had he lived. I think. Wow. It was Stanley Barnes. Stanley Barnes? Mm-hmm. Oh, I'll be darned. Huh. That must and have now, been. And now uh, Link's two other sons, uh, da- uh, Tim and Roger Barnes, uh, are with my son, David Steele, in a band called David Steele and the Barnes Brothers Band. Ah, that's who that is. Yeah, that's who that is. That's my son and my two nephews. <laughs> you must be thrilled then, huh? Oh, I am. Yeah, I certainly am. And anyway... Um, so I'd had the good career in, in Omaha for a lot of years, but I'll tell you a little bit about that because it's kind of interesting. Country music was so different back then. You couldn't have gotten a country singer in one of the finer lounges or motel lounges or steakhouses then. You know, it was it, that just wasn't, country music just wasn't done then much in the Midwest. Hmm. So, but I could play piano and I could play guitar both. So what I, what I did is um, I would uh, uh, get myself a job playing the big piano. The piano bars were real famous back then. Yes. You I, know, where mm-hmm. they'd have a big black baby grand piano and somebody would sit there and play it and then sing along and get the audience singing. Well, I did that. And once I got my audience established, I'd bring in a guitar and ask the bartender or the manager if I could maybe play a couple of, of uh, country songs. And they allowed me to do it because I always dressed real fancy, you know, swanky looking, not looking like country. Uh-huh. And uh, I pick up the guitar. And once I once I played a few country songs, they never let me go back to the piano. <laughs> <laughs> and so, honestly, I, I'm not saying this in an e- egotistical way, but I really believe I pioneered. I helped pioneer the country music in the Omaha area, in the finer places in town. Uh, I believe that would be probably correct, yeah, I w- and, and, a, and a lot of other places as well. I mean, you had a lot of influence on so many decades of music, it's it's just hard to fathom what you've done. It's been fascinating. I'm the luckiest woman in the world is when it comes to music, I really am. One of the things that uh, I was noticing when I was looking at your history and all is that, and I only bring this up because... Uh, humor, hu- humor really can heal people as well as a, a good song can heal people. And and you had a character, and I don't mean to jump ahead on you, and I want you to circle back and go back. But you had a character named Nashville Nelly. Yes, I, I guess I did, and I still do. And and how did that come about? Because that's that's got to be a story in itself. It is uh, back in the in the in the nineteen nineties. Uh, by then, of course, I was living in Nashville again. I moved in and out of there five times. Oh, wow. Yeah. But um, that's a long story you don't have time for. <laughs> okay. but, uh, well, I do have time. You can tell me whatever you want. It's your it's your show. <laughs> oh. Well, hey, all right. <laughs> well, listen, um, the, what happened was I was going for, for a, a professional photo shoot to get some publicity pictures taken of myself. And I had an agent at the time who was a prize-winning photographer named Mitch Karam. Everybody in Nashville knows him and knew yeah. him. Mm-hmm. Great guy. And anyway, he he had just gotten the contract to shoot a cover for the Mrs. America contest, Tennessee contest. Not Mrs. America, I'm sorry. Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Tennessee. Oh, okay. And they were going to use one of Mitch's um, 
photos on the cover. So what he asked me to do, he said, Ruthie, when you come in for your photo shoot tomorrow, he said, please come just totally undone. Just get out of the shower and come. Don't put any makeup on. Don't do your hair. Nothing. And he said, I've got some, he said, I'm going to ask you if you will pose like the before and after picture for glamour shots. Uh Uh-huh. And he said, I'm going to ugly you up so bad nobody will recognize you. And then I'll shoot the real nice one, you know, the good pictures. of you." Because back in the day, I was a pretty good-looking woman. Yes, you and, were. Uh, you still are. So, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> Come on. Anyway, um, and I didn't realize it. You know, I look back now, I think, well, I wasn't too bad, you know. But no. anyway, uh, uh, so that's what we did. He made me up in this bag lady. Uh-huh. Well, you'd never know it was me. And we took that picture. It's wonderful because I like to, I'm kind of, I love to clown around anyway. Uh-huh. And um, he took a bunch of those and then he, you know, made me look really, really great. And um, then the cover of the magazine, I'll send it to you an email as a, as a first chance I get. Um, on one and a half of the page it says, Mitch, can you make me look glamorous? And it shows Nashville and LA. And uh-huh. then it cuts to the other half of the page, and it's Ruthie looking absolutely great. Ah. Uh. As you betcha. Or, <laughs> yes, I can, or something like that. You said that, that out. That's I got Nashville Nelly. Well, he said to me, he said, you know, Ruthie, he said, that is so beautiful, what we just did and what we just, uh, that, that old bag lady said, why don't you work her into your act? You know, because ah. I was still actively performing then. And so that's exactly what I did. And long story short, wow, I think it was 1994, 1995, I got an offer from the 10-piece um, Nashville Review Band. 10 pieces, man. Wow. Uh, that's my favorite thing is those kind of bands. I love them. Oh, that. yeah. And they had wonderful people. And they had um, um, a big bus, just like Reba McIntyre's, you know, one of those great big silver eagle buses. And... And Nashville and Ellie was the uh, comedy act. Ah. And we traveled all over the country opening shows for older opera stars like Jack Green and Jim Ed Brown and people like that. Wow. And yeah. so uh, I kept her alive for quite a while. I still drag her out every now and then. You know, she's uh, wonderful. And I wrote a lot of funny songs for her to sing, which I've got up on Facebook and so forth, too, on Nashville and LA's page. Yeah. Yeah, by the way, um, we got we we started off asking, and I got away from that subject because you were told us that where you were originally from in Iowa, and then uh, you, you've obviously lived other places. When you were in uh, Iowa, and what brought you to Nashville? How did you make your way to Nashville? And then jump back and, you know, give me a little more of Nashville and LA here in a minute, but I'm, I, I keep... I had my note here, and I forgot to ask you, well, how did you eventually get to Nashville? Well, uh, I had an agent. Her name was Betty Satterfield back when I was about 32. I just had I had my sixth baby. Little Kathy was just uh, wow. about a year or so old, and um, uh, my agent knew the secretary to Hank Williams uh, Sr.'s second wife. <laughs> uh-huh. That's how things happen sometimes, you know? Uh-huh. And uh, so she made an appointment for us to have an appointment with Cedarwood Publishing Company, John Denny's company, wow. which uh, was the, one of the largest, if not the largest, country publishing com- company at that time in Nashville. Yeah. And um, Jim Denny, the founder, had been the manager of the Grand Ole Opry, too, in addition to building his Cedarwood Publishing Company and everything. And... Uh, so she, uh, Betty, got an appointment for us to see John Denny to pitch my songs. She didn't take me down there to pitch me as a singer, because by now I'd written quite a few songs, and you can't do much with them in Omaha, Nebraska, you know. Right. So um, we got down there, and uh, they were very nice. And, I, of course, I, I just made homemade demos, just me and the guitar, on a tape recorder. And that's what we took down there to play for uh, this famous man, John Denny. And um, he played all 12 of them, played right straight through without stopping. And when he came out, back out of the booth in the, in the recording studio, he said, I love them. He said, I'm gonna, he said I want to sign you to Cedarwood Publishing as a writer. Wow. He said, by the way, who was that singing your demos? <laughs> My agent said, that was Ruthie. He said, that was you? And I said, yes, sir. He said, well, who 
who do you do you, who do you record for? And I said, no one. He said, well, you do now. <laughs> that must be true. <laughs> it's just that simple. And he signed me to a publish a, a, not only a publishing company a, a, a contract, but also to a, a recording contract, a Nashville recording contract. Oh, you must have been thrilled. Oh my gosh, I couldn't believe it. And Ruthie. You, we left off talking uh, about how you'd gotten your recording contract and, and how your brother had come and joined you, Max Barnes. So can we pick up from there? Yes. Uh, Max was uh, my younger brother. He was three years younger. And uh, I learned to play guitar when I was 15, and then I, he was 12, and so I taught him to play the guitar when he was 12. And we worked together off and on uh, in the Omaha and the Iowa and Nebraska area. Uh, all of our lives from that time on uh, until we were like in our early 30s. Uh huh. And wow. then, uh, like I was telling you about how I went to Nashville and got the recording contracts and all. Right. Well, I couldn't move to Nashville because I had a husband with a good job and we had a new home there in Omaha and um, uh, I had six children. The youngest was just a year old baby. Wow, that's a group, huh? <laughs> yeah, and Loretta Lynn was coming up at the same time, and she had six children, too. Yeah, I know. That's amazing. That, yeah. yeah, and her story was her husband just stayed home and take care of the kids, and she went out on the road and did her thing. I couldn't do that. Uh, so uh, Jed Records released some singles on me, and we had some wonderful musicians. Um on the on the session they did a whole album actually yeah you had some really great ones uh, um uh i'm thinking about uh some of them that you had mentioned earlier uh, elvis presley's drummer uh one of the greatest uh, fiddlers jd fontana jd fontana oh jd uh, he uh he had been elvis presley's uh drummer and i mean he's a very very famous drummer and then we had larry butler on piano who became very, very famous for producing Kenny Rogers and John Denver. Among many others. He's yeah, amazing. among many others. Yeah. And a very famous man. Mm -hmm. And we on this, on my session, I was so honored, you know, a little gal from Omaha. Anyway, uh, and we had Scotty Stoneman from the famous Stoneman family. Wow. And uh, Scotty died not too long after that. I think two or three years after that, Scotty died. But he, you'll hear him on the, when I send you some of those songs, you'll hear him playing the fiddle on those songs. Great. Um, and Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, so um, after uh, after I got firmly established with uh, the Nashville Record and, and uh, Publishing Company, uh, I made a trip to Nashville and I took some of my brother Max's tapes down there because he was writing songs too. But he'd never been to Nashville, so I took them down and I, I played them for John Denny and, and the people at Cedarwood and, and Jed Records, and they loved him. They fell in love with him and signed him. Also, wow. so for a while there, Max and I were on the same record label, separately, but on the same record label and writing for the same company. Boy, you guys must have been thrilled, huh? <laughs> oh, boy, I tell you. I mean, man, that's incredible. I mean, brother and sister, and, and, and that's really incredible. Tell us about those days. What was it like to, to work with them? Some of the songs that you guys wrote, and I know you wanted us to play some for you as well, so tell us about those songs and how they came about. Well, uh, excuse me. Um, Max, Max and I never wrote a lot of them together, uh, but we do have a few, and uh, one that during the course of this uh, phone call, I hope that you'll play one called Life is a Hard-Blowing Wind. Yeah, that one's a great one. We heard that one on your... Uh, Max, I wrote that, but let me tell you how that happened. My Actually, my grandson, a co-writer on it, he was eight years old. It was a Halloween night, and we were sitting at the kitchen table, and it was raining and pouring, and wind was blowing, and I was sitting there by the sliding glass doors near the patio with my tablet writing, as usual. And I couldn't take him out trick-or-treating because it was raining and blowing. Oh, yeah. He pulled the curtain back and he said to me, Hey, Grandma, hey, why don't you write this? Hard-blowing wind. Hard-blowing wind. I know, Grandma. Life is a hard-blowing wind. So that's how that song was born. Oh, my gosh. Eight-year-old boy. I'll be darned. <laughs> His name is Jason Allen Steele. <laughs> well, Jason Allen. I want Allen. everybody to know who, who uh, gave birth to that song. That must and have... 
uh, so I wrote the words, and then I, I took it to uh, Max and showed him. He absolutely loved it, and he wanted to know if he could go write it, because there were a couple of lines that he thought he could write better, which he did. And uh, so he and I are co-writers on the music, along with Jason, and then a wonderful uh, Nashville writer-singer named Leon Reese actually wrote the melody for it. Wow. That's that's amazing. Well, so Life is a Hard Blowing Wind is probably... I. That may be the one I'd like you to play first if you have it handy. If okay. You can do it. Well, we're going to do that right now, okay? So uh, right now, Thanks. you're listening to WRFM, yeah. Radio Free Nashville, and here's Ruthie Steele. Make a note here. I hope Ruthie don't mind, but not many people out there know this. But uh, um, Ruthie did this interview just before going in for surgery. She had surgery the next morning, so this next segment she talks a little bit about some of that. And um, so, you know, just so you know, and uh, if that doesn't show you the passion and love that she has for songwriting and for the songwriters, okay, Ruthie. So, so after you guys got that song cut, what were some of the other songs that you did that got? cut by other people because you you've had an amazing amount of cuts and, and and your brothers had an amazing amount of cuts so can you tell us how that how that uh man it must have just thrilled you the first time you had your your first cut well uh, yes uh, yeah, as a matter of fact a young man on uh jed records at the time um uh, recorded a song that i'd written called muddy bay waters muddy bay. and it was a song about a person who was contemplating suicide. It was a great song. Or, well, listen to me. Um, it was a very good song. And uh, uh, Don Hamilton was his name. He was on Jed Records. I I don't know whatever happened to him. But uh, he did a great job. And so as a, because I'd been writing songs since I was eight years old, that was a, probably an even bigger thrill to me than hearing myself on a record. Wow. 
That's when I heard somebody else actually sing one of my songs. That was just amazing. Kind of gives you a, 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 some kind of validation, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. I mean, well, see, it's another thing, too. I have, there have been a lot of people who've recorded my songs, but, uh, but they have all been uh, independent artists. I've never had a cut by a major label artist. Oh, uh, it was Max that had those? Oh, Max had those, yeah. He had, all, he had all the, well, he had a lot by Indies, too, but he had, oh, every major artist in the business for about 30 years got Max D songs. I, it was incredible, wasn't it? Uh, Vern Gosden cut 47 Max wow. D Barnes songs. Forty-seven. That's incredible. I know, but uh, enough about Max. <laughs> yeah. no, I'm just kidding. No, Max is an incredible writer. He wrote um, "Who's Gonna Fill Their Shoes" for George Jones. He wrote "Chiseled in Stone" for Vern Gosden, which won Song of the Year in 1989. Those are some amazing songs, you know. Chiseled. He wrote "Look at Us," which won Song of the Year in 1992 for Vince with Vince Gill. Wow. But that's, I mean, I, we'll talk more about him later, but he, he had, by virtue, Ray Price, uh, Reba McIntyre, Conway Twitty, they all did his songs. That must have been incredible. And that's I had wonderful indie, indie artists, but they're not as well known, or name brands uh, like uh, Garth Brooks and so forth. Uh, they're, uh, but uh, Clinton Gregory is a pretty well-known name, and he recorded one of my songs that I wrote with my daughter Kathy. I had an opportunity to hear Clinton Gregory at the uh, Commodore here just recently, and he oh. he was amazing, you know. And uh, uh, he played several songs that just uh, just he's just an amazing writer and player. Must yes, have been. he is. He's a champion fiddle player too. Yeah, and that's what everybody tells me that you just put it in his hands and it, it, he just kind of molds into it, you know. He's, oh, he's he, fantastic. He is. He's incredible. So it must be great working with all those people. I mean, my gosh, you've had such an expansive career. It's just hard to pick out any one area of it. But, you know, we were talking about Nashville Nelly and, uh, earlier, and, and then we kind of got off on, and talked about some other things that uh, your brother and, and such. And Can you go back to Nashville Nelly? Uh, are you ever going to bring her out again, do you think? Or? Oh, absolutely, because, you see, uh, the older I get, the less makeup I have to use to <laughs> used to put on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> Tongue in cheek there. But, uh, but anyway, yes, Nashville Nelly, what she is, is she's a very realistic old uh, bank lady. In other words, she's like a, she's a homeless person. Uh huh. But yeah. she's lived and she's a good, solid, decent human being and she's lived a good life and she's, but she's still very optimistic and uh, looks on the bright side of things and she doesn't cry in her beer, she doesn't even drink. <laughs> so, <laughs> and she she always said that she'd be a stand up comic if she could do it lying down. <laughs> 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 so I don't write jokes for her. I write funny songs for her. We we for instance, well, Nellie and I were like split personalities. So, but anyway, I'll talk about her and the different person. Okay, Nellie um, sings songs that I wrote for her called things like uh, "Think Like a Man, Work Like a Dog." <laughs> Yeah, I heard some of those. Eh? Yeah, and and you know it was true, especially in the music business. Back when I was coming up, the females didn't have as much of a uh, chance in the music business as they do today. Yeah, that's what I was want, wanting to know about those early years. It was really tough for women. Uh, you know, the men but, it, they got they got the limelight, but the women they they uh, had to really struggle to get it. You know, and uh, absolutely. Uh, I've heard several stories uh, about that from other artists and such that it was really tough on. Tell it, tell us about that because they. I mean, you're right. I, I can in in some of the history I've read on on the internet anyway that uh, it was really tough for women at that time. Well, it was, and uh, as a matter of fact, I went on to become a record producer too, and that was another field that was pretty much, uh, you know, um, full of male producers and very few female producers. Uh, but you know what, though? What? The boys have a hard time, too. Let's just, let's just lay it out there. It's tough in the music business to really get some place. Yeah, it sure is. It, it, and, it, I mean, if it, it, you know, I have worked with so many young people through the years as I branched out into other areas of the music business. Um, and I've worked with so many wonderful talents that came through town that were just 
incredibly talented, great writers, great singers, everything. But unless they had good financial backers, it was almost impossible to get them where they needed to go. Yeah, you know, that that is so true. And, and it seems like uh, I've heard stories about Garth and, and Clint Black and others that have come to town. And if they hadn't had the the financial backing that they did, they, they probably had a much more difficult time. But they still had the talent to do it. And you were telling me earlier when we were talking on the phone before the interview that uh, back in that day, uh, people, were, it was more on their talent than you know than anything else and and today it's kind of uh, gotten really away from that and it's uh can you explain like, that I, I don't want to excuse me i didn't mean to interrupt you oh, i no. don't want to uh, disparage the the singers that are, have come since my day you know because i've been here forever but uh no there's wonderful talent out there now but but back in in the old old times when i first got started there were a lot of heck williams didn't have any. Elvis Presley didn't have money. To get, they didn't have backers to get started. That's right. They just walked in and played. I, I remember this. Yeah. yeah. But <laughs> as as the years went by, um, it became more and more where uh, the people that you wound up with recording contracts were people who had the money with the financial backer behind them. So that the record companies wouldn't be totally at risk, you know, financially. Yeah, they uh, kept getting away from artist development over the years, it seems. Away from what? Um, the record companies, as the years went on, seemed to get away from uh, the actual artist development, whereas in your when you'd first come up, you said Hank Williams didn't, he didn't have a backer, and yet he was taken in, and, and uh, they, he was recorded and such. So, yeah, yeah um, you were saying that uh, today you need a, a, a lot of backing in order to take a tour around the world or around the United States even. Well, I, I think, and I shouldn't say that, I mean, I'm not making a blanket statement because God knows every one of them works hard, you know. They work hard and every one of them deserve to be where they are. But we get there in different ways than they did in the old days. Oh, yeah. Uh, most of the people coming up in the old days um, did not have any financial backing. They just made it on pure raw talent. Another thing, too, there was less competition out there then than there is now. Good Lord, I'm glad I'm not trying to start out today. Oh, yeah, it would be tough. I give these young people a lot of credit for it. You know, there's another thing, too, is like uh, Quentin Gregory, God love him, his daddy was a famous fiddle player, too. And uh, I met Clinton through um, uh, J uh, Audrey and John Wiggins. And they went on to become, uh, I think they were on Mercury. They got uh, signed, and uh, he was a friend of theirs. I didn't know Clinton, but they pitched my uh, the song to him that John helped me write. John Wiggins and I and my daughter Kathy wrote a song called Darling Does He? And that's what Clinton Gregory uh, recorded. So John and Audrey came to town, and they made it. But their daddy had been the lead guitar player, I think it was, for Ernest Tubb. Yeah, so they had some connections, you know, as mm. far as that is concerned. But John and Audrey were tremendously talented young people. And, um, and John, I believe, is still writing professionally. I don't know. I haven't heard from Audrey in a long time. Huh. You know, Ruthie, I had an opportunity today to be with one of your old friends, uh, Bill Littleton. And, oh, and Bill, Bill Littleton. Bill I wanted me to guy. tell you hi. So uh, um, how did you and Bill meet anyway? And, and give me a little of that, if you would. Well, uh, to be honest with you, I don't remember exactly how we met. Uh, we may have had a mutual friend, a, a female producer named Jean Zimmerman, who was really doing great things on Music Row there when I uh, got to move back to town for about the fourth time. Um, and uh, she introduced me to an awful lot of people. I think she was the one that introduced me to uh, to Bill. But Bill was, uh, he was one of these people that he'd help everybody. He loved everybody, and he, I think he still does that today, you know, encouraging the young people and... Um, He's a wonderful entertainer himself, and uh, I, I have nothing but praise for that man. I love him. Tell him I said hello, and tell him to call me. <laughs> I tell him to call you. I really, really will. Yeah. yeah, it was it was great, and he he was saying that you know just like you were saying that back in the day, uh, um, 
that there was it, it was just a different music taking some of the heart out of it he said well but i don't think that that's uh the fault of the artist i think it's the way the record industry evolved you know and business is business one one thing people really have to realize is the music business is business yeah i think they forget that and uh, as a matter of fact, there are two wonderful books. May I plug them? I didn't write either one of them. Sure. But for any listener out there who happens to be a, an aspiring songwriter, go either to your library or to wherever they sell books, you know, your favorite bookstore, and get The Craft of Lyric Writing by Dr. Sheila Davis. And the other one is called This Business of Music. And I forget the authors, but it's very well known. I think they put out about four different uh, versions of it. This business of music, it teaches you about the... It's a business. You can't just make it today just on talent. You've got to know what you're doing. You're a product, and you've got to sell yourself. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. It takes a lot of effort. And today it seems like it's moving towards the social networks uh, for an artist to distrib you know, for distribution. It seems to be the peer-to-peer -peer networks. Uh, radio... Is not you know, it's not letting uh, some of the older artists have their songs played anymore. So how, how do you know? How do you feel about that? You know, I mean, I, I know you're pretty vocal on a lot of the issues, and and uh, can you give us our opinion, your opinion of uh, how things are going and what you think is going to happen? Well, I had some experience as a as a um, uh, record promoter for a Christian uh, a gospel uh, music company, uh, HMG Higgins Music Group. Uh huh. Uh, I was doing that, oh, I think it was 1989 and 1988, or 1998. I think it, up till the year 2000 I did that with the Christian. So I, so I got to speak with and become acquainted with the, with the um, DJs and so forth. And um, there are so many layers to the music business to, to take from the raw talent, the young man or, or old man or woman or whatever the singer and the songwriter and to get them to where they are marketable and where you, a record company can make their money back off their investment and it's just uh, it's a whole lot different than the average person thinks it is yeah there's many many layers that's for sure um, I was listening to some of your stuff and you mentioned a song and you want to tell them that one that you and your daughter wrote and tell them about that one yes uh I just uh, uh, I just got another cut. This song's been recorded about four times by different artists, including myself. But it's a song called "Life Is Not Always a Rainbow, Love Is Not Always a Rose." And to shorten the title for practical purposes, we just call it "Love Is Not Always a Rose." Uh, my youngest daughter, Kathy, um, was diagnosed with uh, bone cancer in her jaw when she was 19 years old. Oh, huh. And she was a young married woman, had two little baby boys, a 10-month-old and a 2-year-old. And she had been misdiagnosed by five different doctors before they decided what it was, and by that time it was too late. Oh, how tragic. And uh, this song, uh, I she was in the hospital off and on most of the time for the 14 months after that. And I stayed at, I closed down my Nashville business, went back to Omaha, Nebraska, where she lived, and... Um, I um, um, I stayed at the hospital room. They, she had two beds in there, and they let me actually sleep there every time I wanted to. So I was there almost all the time for all, uh, about a year. Wow. And she uh, she wasn't a songwriter, but she could think up interesting titles and things like that. She could think up interesting lines. So we wrote a lot of stuff while we were, you know, killing time, so to speak. And she went through 13 surgeries and chemotherapy and radiation and, oh, just a horrible, horrible 14 months. Oh, but man. About uh, two months before she died, uh, she, when she was a little girl, she loved rainbows and she loved yellow roses. And it just so happened, a couple of months before she died, um, I had found a one of those glass hanging rainbows that you put in your window and the sun shines through. Yes, uh-huh. <clears throat> and the man that I was dating back in Nashville at the time uh, that I later married, uh, uh, my last husband, um, he had sent me from Nashville to Omaha, he had sent me uh, 
a dozen yellow roses and a dozen yellow roses for Kathy. I'll be done. So I, she was asleep when they were delivered, and so I said I put I hung that rainbow thing up on her hospital window, and then on this windowsill I set those uh, bouquets of yellow roses right under the rainbow hanging uh, oh. decoration. And when she woke from her nap, she looked over there. And she didn't say anything for a while, and then she said, she looked at that and studied the roses and the rainbow, and I told her that Dick had sent the roses for us and wished her well and all that. She said, uh, Mom, get your pen. And so I picked up my pen and my writing tablet, and she said, write this down. She said, life is not always a rainbow, and love is not always a rose. Wow. Because her husband had just divorced her. Oh, my. In addition to the cancer that was killing her. Oh. And I know this is sad, and I don't mean to be a sad sack, because this is a positive song. And you wouldn't believe the lines that that little girl wrote in there that are positive. She says, I just try to stay dry when it's raining and stay warm when the winter wind blows. Because I know life is not always a rainbow, and love is not always a rose. That's amazing. That's amazing. And little Kathy, she... Anyway. Well, why don't we play that song right now? So here we are. We're going to play this Life is Not Always a Rainbow and Love is Not Always a Rose by Ruthie Steele. And we dedicate this and to Kathy her daughter. Kathy Steele Helms. Kathy Steele Helms. And, we and dedicate, Ken Knight. And Ken Knight. Well, Ruthie, we're going to dedicate that to, to the memory of them and, and that you have a successful day tomorrow. How's that? Thank you. God bless you, Bobby. I just appreciate, especially playing Life is a Hard Blowing Wind and Love is Not Always a Rose. Well, we're going to play some more for you, so let's do this one right now.
Hi, this is Bobby Pizzazz, and I'm honored to be with the great Ruthie Steele tonight. And uh, Ruthie's calling in from Gainesville, Georgia. And Ruthie, uh, we're back on the air, so uh, it's your show. And so you want to continue and just fill us in, and uh, we know where we left off with your with your last song there. So take us to the next one. Well, um, most people, by the time they're as old as I am, have been married more than one time. Right? Yeah, that's pretty true. Uh huh. Okay. Well, anyway, my son David is I'm a, on number uh, three. a wonderful performer. He sounds a lot like Waylon Jennings, that type of singer, and he's a wonderful performer. Had his own show up at the Riverboat Queen up in Branson, and he's performed professionally since he was six. Anyway, um, we wrote this song called Fighting Another Man's War. And it's about the man who married a woman who'd been married and terribly, terribly hurt by love before him. You know, uh -huh. and there's no way of winning when you're fighting another man's war. In other words, he was trying to love her. Like she always wanted to be loved and do all that, but she was still so scarred from the first marriage that he knew he, he just couldn't win. And it's a great song called Fighting Another Man's War, and it's sung by David Steele. And we're going to get to that song right now. Uh, and then we're going to come back here in a little bit. And Ruthie's got to get off the phone here because she's got a big day tomorrow. And we're going to pick this interview back up again uh, when she gets back and better. And Ruthie, we really are very honored that you're here tonight. And we're going to be right back after this song and let you finish out the night for us, okay? So here is uh, Ruthie Steele's song. David Steele. David Steele singing it. She was wounded by love when he met her And the battle was raging within She was too tired to fight when he met her that night And his loving arms took her in Treated her like a lady Like she'd never been treated before But he can't win her heart He was doomed from the start Cause he's fighting another man's war Another man wounded the lady And the scars on her heart heal real slow chance of winning the battle when you're fighting another man's war when you're fighting another Okay, Ruthie, we're back. Uh, so that's a beautiful song, by the way. And uh, yeah. uh, my gosh, I, I don't know how many relationships have gone through that similar situation. There, uh, it's a, it's it's really really something. It really touched me. So, uh, want to tell us some more that's on your mind? Anything that's on your mind that you want to get off your mind and want your radio audience to listen to? This is a songwriter show, and you're you're for sure a great songwriter. So, we you got some pointers for everybody out there. I mean, how did you come about writing songs? What what do you what's your method of writing songs? How do you go about it? Well, uh, Harlan 
Harlan Howard said this, of course, I kind of figured this before, but Harlan Howard is quoted as saying, a uh, country song is like a three-minute movie, a beginning, a middle, and an end. Yes, I've heard that. Mm-hmm. Oh, check your check your lyrics. Uh, my my personal opinion is that the lyrics are a whole lot harder to uh, write than the music because you, uh, everything's been done. I've got another song. I don't know if you have it, Bobby, but uh, called "The Winds of Time." Yeah, I think we do have that one. Uh huh. Winds of Time. It says no song's been sung that won't be sung again someday because you stop and think we had how many notes in the in the scale? Seven. <laughs> seven notes of the scale, and yet there have been millions of songs written. That's incredible, isn't it? So when you write songs, do they just come all at once, or does it take you time to labor over the lyric? Or, um... Well, they, 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 I start with a hook. I mean, be careful talking around me, because I'll write a hook, you know? Uh-huh. Uh, if, somebody, if somebody says something that sounds kind of profound or funny or whatever, uh, if it sparks a title to a song, for me, my pen starts moving, you know? <laughs> and uh, I write words and music both, but the lyrics just, it seems like the, once I get that, that um, uh, title or the, or the um, hook of the song, the rest of it is simple, because I'm a poet, too. I've written a lot of poetry. Yes, you have. And so I've never published a book of it, but I've got about ten books of it ready to go in case anybody's interested. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, for can I? I'd like to just talk for a minute to actually to the songwriters about writing. Can I just do that? You surely can. That's what you're here for. You go right ahead. Okay. Listen, I want to say to all you folks who are writing, and um, even if you've written one song, fantastic. I don't care if you're 90 years old when you write your first one. Just write something down and get started. There's a particular type of writing. It doesn't necessarily uh, uh, apply just to songwriting, but to writing in general called the, f- the, the free flow of, uh, of words. Just pick up your pen and start something. Even if you don't know what you're going to write when you sit down to write, you will amaze yourself at how many times something neat will fall out of your brain and land on your tablet yeah. or on your keyboard, however you're doing it. And uh, I'm dating myself by saying pad, pen and pencils and tablets, aren't I? Everybody does it on the computer today. But anyway, um, just uh, let yourself go and do realize that no song's been sung that won't be sung again someday because there's only seven notes in the scale when it comes to the music. But to me, and this is because I'm a country writer primarily, to me, the words are the most important thing in the song. And almost all of my songs are pretty much based on true life, either my own or somebody I know or somebody I'd heard of that I knew about or something like that. Um, some of it's pure fiction, especially the funny songs that I write for Nashville and L.A. <laughs> yeah, those are funny. Yeah, I'm going to write a song about Bobby because I love that name, Bobby Pizzazz. I love that. <laughs> Part of it, I knew myself Ruthie or something. <laughs> yeah, Annie did. She's Mrs. Pizzazz, all right. And I love the name Annie. My middle name was Ann, and my grandmother's name was Anna, and I just, I love that name, Annie. I, I love that. And, and I'm so grateful. I have lived the most wonderful life, and I've been so blessed. Yes, you have had a, an amazing career, Ruthie, and uh, your, your whole family, I mean, you guys were some of the people that made Nashville what it is today.